Okay, so I'm like that that uh, introductory band that nobody told you was going to be there before the really good concerts start. You're just going to have to kind of put up with me a little bit, and then I'll be out of your way. So, um, as Bracken mentioned, I'm a conservation planner um, here in the Tremont office. Some of you know me. Some of you, I've worked with you guys before. So, you're not going to get rid of me anytime soon, I hope. <laughs> so, I want to just kind of start off with asking the question, why are we even here? Why are we talking about soil health? You know, what's, what's so important about, about that? Don't we normally talk about, you know, if we're at the coffee shop or anything like that, we're talking about yield, right? We're talking about our crops. That's, that's what we sell. That's what we take to the bank. That's what we produce, right? I don't think there's a lot of guys out here that uh, go to the coffee shop and start talking about their soil too much, you know? Unless it's, you know, that darn field there that doesn't produce very well. It's got that compacted soil. It's horrible. We usually kind of dog on it. What do we call it? We call it dirt. You know, so we pick on soil quite a bit. But what I want us to kind of think about is think about that as, sorry, I hit the clicker here. There we go. Our soil is like our factory. We produce things. Our crops are our products. But the soil is our factory where we produce that. Okay, if we don't have a good, a good factory, we're not going to produce very good crops. You know, we got to think of it when we talk about plant nutrients, things that they need. Here's a nice, good, long list. Okay, basically, carbon, oxygen, the rest come from the soil. So. I think you, we want to make sure that we treat that soil right so it can produce a healthy crop that gives us a good yield, that gives us a good thing to, a good commodity to sell and make some money, right? Another way to think of it is we sometimes want a Ferrari, but we use these guys at this mechanic shop to fix it. Doesn't work out very well, right? You want to trust those guys with a Ferrari? Sometimes we treat our, treat our crops and our soil so bad, thinking we can get A with using B, okay? But there is hope, right? Now, this is a lot of words and really long, but this is a definition of soil health from the FAO. And they try and cover every basis, but we got a nice little picture of some healthy soil there, too. Yeah, hey, that helps. Perfect. So, basically, a healthy soil is one that produces things. It's resilient to drought. It's resilient to flooding. It's, it's healthy. We know what healthy means when we talk about ourselves, if we're not healthy or healthy. You know, it's the same thing with soils. It's a living thing, and if it's healthy, it does its job right. It functions properly in all regards. Okay, and it can support life. Now, I'm going to zoom in on our little friend here. We have a, this is a professional worm model. Okay. That healthy soil, if you look at it, it looks like, like a dark, moist chocolate cake. It's got lots of structure. There's a lot of pore space. There's living organisms inside of it. That's what we want. When you're looking for a healthy soil, that's what it looks like. Dark in color. It's got a lot of carbon, organic matter. Okay. You want chocolate cake. Okay. Now, these are the five principles of soil health. So what we got there is we have a, a, not a healthy soil on the one side and a healthy soil on the other side. You can change one into the other, and it does go backwards as well, based on how you treat it. So we break it up into five principles. Number one is to keep the soil covered, maximize the cover. You know, we call residue trash. We want that trash on top. We want to keep that residue there. Minimize our soil disturbance. Okay? We, don't, we don't want to go in there and just rip that soil to pieces and keep breaking it up with tillage. Okay? That disturbance breaks up the structure and, and damages the organisms and things that we want in there. We want to maximize our biodiversity. We don't want to focus just on growing one crop. We want crop rotations. We want to do things that encourage as much beneficial organisms, insects, things like that to come in because they help us, all right? We want to 
diversify the plant community, the insects, the organisms, everything. As much friends as we can get into the picture, the better. Okay, keeping a living root. So we want to try and have a plant in that ground that's living as long as possible. And I'll kind of go into detail a little bit more why that's, that's important. And then lastly, integrating livestock. This is kind of sometimes when you see soil health presentations, they don't always necessarily mention this one, but livestock has become a key in keeping these biological processes that keep the soil healthy going. They are a good tool for us to use that really jumpstart the process of building soil health back. Okay, so maximizing soil cover. Here's a couple benefits. You know, it protects it against wind and water erosion. We have both of those in this county. You know, we've had, had some issues out, you know, in Blue Creek area and stuff like that. We spent a lot of money building terraces and stuff like that to try and keep uh, water erosion from becoming an issue. If you look up in the top corner, that is a raindrop impacting on soil. Looks kind of like a bomb explosion. Each raindrop just hits that soil and it can just detach and throw soil everywhere. When we think at it in size, if a clay particle, which is the smallest, was the size of a golf ball, silt would be about the size of basketball, sand would be about the size of a compact car, now how big do you think a water drop would be to compare it to them? About the size of a 5,000 square foot home. Think of that dropping down on you. Okay, the Wicked Witch of the West, she, she felt it. We know how she was feeling. That's how your soil feels when you don't leave it protected with that residue, with that armor on top that just comes, hammers it. Okay, you've got some wind erosion going on in this farm. You notice it's only blowing off of the field that's, that's tilled. And lastly, this guy down here in the desert, he wishes he had planted a cover crop. He's just sitting there going, oh man, I should have. You know, protect the soil from that hot sun. Okay, minimizing our soil disturbance. You know, if we minimize disturbance, we build and maintain structural organic matter. This is a really good little infographic from, from our friends up north of the border that they created. You see no-till on the one side. It's got a lot of nice structure, the soil, you know, plants and everything are there. And you notice on the other side, we've got compaction and crusting, all those things that we hate. Each time we till and do those things, we break up that structure that keeps it from doing that, keeps it from compacting, keeps it from crusting. So we're not helping ourselves. We're also introducing more oxygen into the environment and causes the microbes and stuff to go super fast and burn up all of your carbon inside that soil, burn up all that organic matter that you're trying to keep. Okay? And then in turn, you know, that lets off carbon dioxide, and, and we know how a lot of people don't like the idea of, of putting more CO2 in the air. Okay, maximizing biodiversity. Again, you know, through crop rotations, cover crops, other things. The more, the more diverse the system is, the more resilient, the more it attracts, you know, the beneficial insects. There's a stat that you, you'll probably hear again. There's 1,700 beneficial organisms, beneficial insects to every one pest. So you got a lot of friends on your side if you give them a home, okay? Now I've got a little video here I'm going to play, hopefully it'll work. So this, this video here, if it, cross your fingers, works, it shows a, it's under a microscope, we've got a network of mycorrhizal fungi growing inside a petri dish. And what they're watching for is how bacteria use that as kind of like a highway, okay? And there are good bacteria out there, okay? Every time we talk about, you know, bacteria, nematodes, all these things, we kind of tend to look on the bad side. But see the little, the little guys just sitting there moving up and down? That's bacteria, and they look like they're going on a highway. They're following this hyphae network through, the, through, in this instance, it's in a petri dish, but they would do the same thing in the soil. It allows them to move a lot further. There's bacteria in the soil that help free up phosphorus for us. 
So we definitely want them to be able to do their job and do it quickly. So when we provide an environment that is conducive for these organisms to live in, they're going to help us out too. I mean, they're just going. They're driving like a teenager, aren't they? Now, this is a picture of a root system in a native prairie. It's, it's kind of not, it would be nice if it was a little brighter, but you can notice all the different root structures. We've got fibrous roots and tap roots. Okay, that's another thing that diversity brings us, where it, those plants start accessing different parts of the, of the soil. Most tap roots are put in big channels down that allow for water to go in quickly. The fibrous roots are building a structure that holds the soil together. If you just focus on one or the other, you're, you're going to miss a benefit, right? So we want to definitely encourage maximum amount of diversity. Okay, keeping, keeping a living root. So plants, they do an amazing thing. They take sunlight and water and those are nu nutrients, and they make sugar, okay? It's an amazing thing. If your kids could make sugar from sunlight and water, they'd be the happiest people on earth, right? So these plants use that to live off of, but they're also nice. They like to share it when they get something out of it. So plants, as they, the root structures, they grow, they exude out what we call exudates, okay? Which basically means they put things out in the soil, these sugars, and that's what feeds all of those microorganisms that we're looking for, that we're trying to, to encourage. Okay, so that living root keeps them fed. If there's not a living root, you know, putting sugars out there and stuff, they don't have anything to feed on, they start to die off. So we want to keep them alive. This picture on the right is uh, that mycorrhizal fungi. Okay, that's growing off of the root, allows it to extend the access the plant has to the soil. So it really likes that. And that mycorrhizal fungi, as we notice, it, it helps transport other things around. It also increases the access of a plant root in the system. You know, your roots by themselves may only access 1% of the soil. But with that hyphae network, as you can see with this tree, it's extended that access to the soil even more than what the plant would be able to do themselves. So we want to keep a plant in there as live, alive as long as possible. Lastly, integrating livestock. Okay. So like I said, they jumpstart this whole process. You know, a lot of our ruminant animals, they're a walking laboratory. They have all kinds of bacteria with them and, and they're finding as these animals graze on our cover crops and things like that, it actually causes this biological process to, to go faster. Grasses, they have developed themselves to be grazed. They like to be grazed. They'll actually produce more roots when they've been grazed on, and things like that. So cattle are really beneficial in helping us rebuild soils. Okay? I'm going to show you some results from a local farmer Oops, I went backwards. <coughs> so we have a, this is a PLFA test, which basically it looks at the different types of organisms that are in the soil and kind of classifies them based on their amino acid makeup. So on the left, we have a cover crop that was not grazed. And on the right, we have a cover crop that was grazed. And these fields are side by side. Okay, same soil types, test was taken at the same time. So there is very little difference in the soil themselves. And the cover crop we used was exactly the same. So there's nothing different other than one was grazed and one was not. Now up in the corner, there's that total number of organisms. If you notice, it says it's only around 1,000 on the non-grazed and it's over 3,000 on the grazed. It doubled the amount of total organisms in this soil just by grazing it. The other thing that's key to look at is down here we have our, see there's a bustule mycorrhizal, okay, percentage. It is zero on the, uh, the non-grazed and 4% on the grazed in that, in that sample. So they wouldn't even be there if it hadn't been grazed. 
Okay, so cattle make a big difference in the system. And remember, that, that mycorrhizal fungi is something we really want. Okay, they are extremely beneficial. All right, so now for my magic trick. Okay, I'm going to take this mic off for a second, just in case, so I don't backfeed. I want to get close to the speaker. Can you hear me? Awesome. All right, so we got a we got a little bit of a show here we're going to put on for you. Okay, so just have two columns of water, and I collected some soils from around. Okay. I know that's kind of hard to see. So this is this is an is a wheat fallow field that's been tilled, okay, for probably the last since the pioneers came here. All right. So it has very little structure. You can see it's there's there's not a whole lot to it. This is not chocolate cake. Okay. So that's what's going to go in this column. And then here. Okay, this, this guy right here, he's got lots of roots to him. He's kind of falling apart on me right here. So this came from 20 feet away near the fence row in an area that hasn't been disturbed for a very long time. So the same exact soil is 20 feet apart. Okay, so I'm not playing any tricks that way. Set these into the into this column and see if how resilient they are. Okay, so we can we notice our tilled one is falling apart faster. Okay, what's happened is because it lacks structure, the weight of the water is trying to push itself into that quad, and as it does that. It's breaking it apart. It's too much pressure for it. It's like a sumo wrestler trying to fit into skinny jeans. Something's got to give, okay? And it's given away. Here, our sumo wrestler, he gets, he's got his comfy sweatpants at home kind of pants on. There's plenty of structure inside there. There's pore space. There's roots and exudates holding it together. It's glued together, okay? It... it it's a healthier soil, just because it wasn't disturbed. But now remember, when I held it up, it kind of felt a little fragile, right? It was falling apart in my hand, but it obviously isn't falling apart in the water. It has plenty of space for that water to come in, okay? So who, <laughs> which one do you want? Which soil do you want out of these two? I mean... You want the one that basically is falling apart in less than a minute? Or do we want the one that can hold itself together? Because as we know in Utah, right, we have pretty severe weather at times. You know, we can get we can get some quite a bit of rain pretty quick. All right. Well, I'm done. You guys know everything I know now, and I'm 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 good. So. Thank you, Tony.